coined, and he and it's it's it says this. Okay, it says every rotation line intersects every constraint line at least once. Okay, so like every profound truth, it's just a one-liner and it's just simple and clear. Okay, and uh, this this is one of the things that absolutely changed my life when I read it as a as a as a grad student. Um, I started. Uh, Realizing the implication of this, and it set the course for my my whole life and what I've what I've done here. So this was this is a very profound thing I, I realized in my life. But what what does it mean here? What is this rule of complementary patterns? Um, what do they mean? Every red rotation line intersects every constraint line at least once. Well, that is the condition that this red line satisfies for it to be an actual degree of freedom. Okay, so let's check. Is it true? Does this line intersect all these guys? Well, let, let's draw it on top of this to begin with. Sure enough, this red line intersects this blue line there. It intersects this blue line there. So it satisfies the condition. By the way, they don't need to be the same point. It doesn't say that. It just says the rotation line needs to intersect the constraint, every constraint line at least once. Okay? If, if it's on top of a constraint line, it would intersect it at infinite places. Okay? So that would work too, because that's, that's the at least once part. Okay? okay, so this red line intersects this guy there, this guy there. Does it intersect this blue line? Yes, it's parallel to it, it intersects at infinity. What about this blue line? Yes, it's parallel to it, it intersects at infinity. What about this blue line? Yes, it's parallel to it, it intersects at this, this point at infinity. And they're all the same point at infinity, right, according to projective geometry. Okay, so according to projective and Euclidean geometry, when you consider finite and infinite space, this red line intersects all the blue lines somewhere at least once. Okay, and again, they don't have to be the same point. So that satisfies it. That is why... Uh, that red rotation line is the degree of freedom of this system. And, and if you stare at it all day, you'll see there's no other possible red line you could draw anywhere that intersects all, those, all five of those blue lines somewhere at least once. That's the only one that works, which is why there's only one degree of freedom in this example. Okay? Any other red line, if you try and rotate it about, will force these blue lines to stretch or compress, which if they're ideal constraints, they're not allowed to do, therefore they're constraints. So if these were ideal constraints, um, then it would be infinitely stiff if I tried to rotate around any other red line, but it would be infinitely compliant. There would be no resistance rotating around this one because it satisfies this rule. So it's a really powerful rule. And um, you can analyze any mechanism with it, any compliant mechanism with it, um, you just draw your blue lines th and then find the red lines that intersect them, okay? And notice this rule holds, it has nothing to do with the shape of the stage or the ground or anything, right? Or even the length or what material it's made of. Um, it's just blue lines and red lines, right? So, so, you know, this ground could have been shaped like Mickey Mouse, this one could have been shaped like a car, this one could have been shaped like my face, and anything, and it really doesn't change the the topology or the location orientation of the blue lines or the red line, okay? And, and I could have made these wires twice as long or short, you know, as, as long as they're wires, long enough to be wires, and I could have changed their diameter a little bit, but as long as it's like a, a long skinny wire that can be, can, can model a, an ideal constraint line, blue line, and regardless of what material it's made of, the material doesn't come into play here at all. Um, it's just according to ideal constraint theory, um, if, if these guys are said to be infinitely stiff along their axis but infinitely compliant in all other directions, then the only information you need to know is the topology, which is the location and orientation of the blue lines, and then you can find the degrees of freedom. And they're independent of everything else. That, that's very profound. Okay? So, and and that, that holds true even when you add reality into the picture where the constraints aren't really purely ideal. Um, it, it ends up being that the topology of the mechanism, meaning uh, the, the number, kind, location, orientation of the, of the elements, the, the wire flexures, how they're located and oriented and how many there are, that's strictly what determines uh, degrees of freedom or directions of greatest compliance according, according to this definition. Okay, okay so let's look, at, um, let's look at this old example we saw. Okay, remember, uh, you know, I told you to find the degrees of freedom and you do a modal analysis and you see uh, that it rotates around this line, okay, right there, and it rotates around this line. Well, um, you know, pretend we didn't know that, okay, or pretend we didn't do this FEA and we couldn't see that and I just gave you this example and I said, find its degrees of freedom. Well, using the rule of complementary patterns, it would be a piece of cake now because what you do is you just 
draw all the blue lines through the axis of these, extend them infinitely long, okay? And then find all the red lines that intersect all four of those lines somewhere at least once. Well, and again, they don't have to be the same point, but, but you know, this is one red line that works. It intersects this guy here, it intersects this guy here, this red line intersects this guy here, and intersects this guy here. So this red line intersects all four of those blue lines somewhere at least once, so it works. Okay? And then, of course, this one also works. This red line intersects this guy here, this guy here, this guy here, this guy here. Okay, those are the only two red lines that you could ever find that intersect all four of those blue lines somewhere at least once. And no wonder, remember, there's four non-redundant constraints. We took six minus four. We were expecting two, two degrees of freedom. And sure enough, we found those two red lines that satisfy uh, this, this condition. Uh, this rotation and that rotation, okay? Okay, so, so you can see how powerful this is. If you, you, know, you have any parallel system with wires sticking into it, you draw the blue lines that go through their axis, and then you can just throw away all the geometry, everything else, and just uh, find all the red lines that intersect all the blue lines somewhere at least once, and you'll have all the ways the system can move. Okay? You'll, you'll know about what axes they can rotate. And, and if they're translations, um, then, then it'll be something interesting, okay? So let me, that, that, that moves me to my next topic, okay? Say you have um, this parallel guide mechanism, okay? So I didn't draw the other rigid body, but say it's stuck to the ground, it's like thatched here and thatched there, and it's got this top stage there, and here's the blades, right? Or the leaf spring, whichever you want to call it, the blade flexure is stuck into it, okay? So now we're not dealing with wires, okay? Well, how would you find, well, first of all, First of all, is this a parallel system? Yes, it's two rigid bodies directly connected. So it's a parallel system, so it can't be under constraint. Is it exactly constrained or over constrained? Um, well, let's look at that and think about this. Um, uh, well, first of all, how many, how many degrees of freedom does it have? Can you visualize it? Like, can it, can it translate up or down? Like, no, this guy, these guys will definitely stretch. Compress. Okay, well, can it uh, translate out this way? Well, no, it'll shear these guys. It can't do that. Okay, can, can it rotate around this axis? No, it'll shear them. Can it rotate around this axis? No, it'll stretch them. Can it rotate around this axis? No, it doesn't work. So the only thing it can do is it can translate perpendicular to the plane of those uh, things. And if I draw every blue line that connects the ground to the stage through there, the translation in this direction, you know, parallel to this line in that direction that's perpendicular to those two blades will be perpendicular to all the blue lines on the blade and so it'll work. Okay, so this is, this is called a parallel guide and it's because it guides a single translation um, that's uh, perpendicular to the blades, okay? Okay, so we know this has one degree of freedom. So that being said, is this system over constrained? Well, Okay, each of these blades, so, so by, by its, you could say, well, it has a blade in it, so it's over-constrained because blades are over-constrained. Well, that's not, I mean, that, that is mathematically true, but that's not useful. Remember, I said blades are in and of themselves not over-constrained. It's not useful to think of them as such. They're not assembled. They're just a single sheet of metal or, or whatever you make them out of. Um, but they do have an order of constraint, an order of constraint of three. So you can see there's three independent blue lines in them. Uh, if you go back to that uh, topic in, in, this, in this lecture, um, I showed that it has an order of constraint of three. So it counts for three independent constraints and has, as a result, six minus three, three degrees of freedom, okay? Okay, so, but still, like, okay, so for practical purposes, it's not over constrained just because it has flexure blades in it, because flexure blades aren't inherently over constrained. Um, according to our, our, our practical convention, they have an order of constraint of three. But, but the problem is we have two flexure blades. And two flexure blades certainly can over constrain a system, right? Because three comes from this one, and three comes from this one. And so that means that's six together, and six minus six should be zero, but we know there's a degree of freedom, a translation. Okay, so yes, indeed, this system is over constrained, okay? Okay, so, so let me just restate a few things to make uh, clarify things. Systems that have blades in them are not inherently over-constrained 
because they have a blade, right? Blades are not inherently over constrained. I already told you this. They have orders of constraint. But if you have multiple blades or multiple wires mixed with blades, you can still have things over constrained, okay? So each blade just counts for three. And so this one is over constrained because this one has three, this one has three, and yet you know there's a single degree of freedom. So it's over constrained by how many? One, right? Um, because there's, there's uh, this counts for three, this counts for three, and yet there should be five non-redundant things in total. So six minus five is one because we know there's one degree of freedom. So there's, there's one redundant, uh, constra you know, it's constrained by one order, you could say, okay? Okay, so fine. So this is a, an over-constrained parallel system that's, again, not under-constrained. This is an example of something that is over-constrained, and it's over-constrained by one redundant constraint, um, but it is uh, not under-constrained because it's a parallel system. It can't have redundant degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's just a review. Okay, but what if I said, let's use the rule of complementary patterns to find how it could move, okay? Say, say I drew, what you would do is you draw every blue line that connects this ground to this stage that, that doesn't exit the geometry. So draw all the blue lines in there, all the blue lines in there. They would all lie on this parallel blue plane and this parallel blue plane, okay? Can't, the question is, can you find any red lines, any red rotation lines that intersect all the blue lines on either of those planes somewhere at least once? Well, this one's a lot trickier, okay? So, so say I draw a red line on this plane, okay, in any way you want. It will intersect or be parallel, which intersects at infinity, every single blue line on this plane, and it might be parallel to some blue lines on this plane and therefore intersect them, but there are other lines on this plane, blue lines, that would be skew to that red line and therefore wouldn't intersect it at infinity. So, First of all, it might be useful to point out what doesn't satisfy the rule of complement patterns. Well, if a red line is parallel or intersects, it does satisfy it, right? Because it intersects it either in finite space or in infinity. But if it's a skew red line, so say you have, here's your blue line and here's your red line and they're, they're, they're not on the same plane and they're skew, then they never intersect at any point and the rule of complement patterns doesn't work. Okay, so if I were to draw a red line on this plane, it would intersect and be parallel to all of these, and it would be parallel to some of these, but it would be skew to all the other ones. So it wouldn't work. It has to work for every single blue line that can exist in the system that passes through the constraints. Okay, so, okay, so no red line works on that plane. And obviously draw a red line on this plane, it's not going to work either. There will be some blue lines on this plane that it's skewed to. So, it's like, well, can we find any red line that works? Well, you can, and the answer is, is that um, you know that every line on this plane and every line on this plane must intersect a line where the two planes intersect, right? If I, if I drew two intersecting planes, right, and then I drew any line on either of those two planes, it would be it would either directly intersect or be parallel to the line where the two planes intersect. Like, think about that, okay? If I, if I have two planes that are intersecting in finite space and the line where they intersect is the line we're interested in, and then I draw any other line on either of those two planes, no matter how I draw it, if it's constrained to be on one of those two planes, it will intersect that line of intersection or be parallel, which means it'll intersect at infinity, okay? so. But now if I take those two planes and I make them both parallel, they still intersect at a line, except that line is an infinite hoop. It's a circle with an infinite radius, okay? And it's, it's, it's in all the directions of the two parallel planes. They intersect up here, they intersect out here, they intersect over there, they intersect down here, right? So the line that intersects with every single line on both these planes is really a red hoop okay, which is a line with an infinite radius, okay, infinitely far away in any direction. And hopefully you can agree by the same logic, any line I draw on this plane uh, will intersect or be parallel to the line that is at the intersection of both these blue planes, which is this line, which means every blue line on this plane and every blue line on this plane, no matter how I draw them, will intersect this red line somewhere at least once at infinity, okay? 
and it is indeed a red line, and it is uh, the plane of that red hoop or circle with an infinite radius um, is uh, parallel to the plane, to these two blue planes. And therefore, guess what? When you think of rotating this block about this red hoop infinitely far away in any, in any way, it kind of spits it out with the translation there. Okay? So it even describes mechanisms that translate the rule of complementary patterns, right? Okay, so just a, a summation, so that means it, it purely translate here. So, summation of how you would analyze a system to find its degree of freedoms with rule of complementary patterns is, if you have wire flexures, you just draw a single blue line through their axis. If you have blade flexures, you think of every blue line in that plane of the, of the blade flexure. Okay, and then what you do is you try and find every red line that intersects all of those blue lines, whether it's the single blue line, through the wires or the infinite number of blue lines on the plane of the blades. Find every red line intersects all those blue lines somewhere at least once and you will find all the degrees of freedom of the system whether that is a red line in finite space that's a rotation or a red line that's infinitely far away and manifests as a translation as an infinite, uh, you know, as a circle or hoop with an infinite radius. Okay? So it's pretty confusing. If you don't get this, you'll, you will, trust me. We'll, we'll do a bunch of things. But the good news is you can stop and rewind this and go back many times, okay? Okay, so, so let's do an example here, okay? So um, again, we have, uh, say these are all, all the, there are six wires here, and they're grounded here at this end, that end, that end, that end, that end, that end. Okay, so is, it, is this a parallel system or a serial system? Well, it's a parallel system, right? It's, it consists of two rigid bodies, the stage and the ground connected directly to by all these things, okay? So is it under constrained or not under constrained? It's not under constrained because it's parallel, okay? Well, is it over constrained? Well, um, that's a good question. Is it exactly constrained or over constrained? Well, if it's exactly constrained, then it's totally exactly constrained, right? Because it has six wires and it's, it's a three-dimensional object, six wires. If, if they're all exactly constrained, it, it, constraining it, meaning if, if they're all non-redundant, they're all, you know, uh, necessary independent things, then, and they're all doing the independent job of killing a degree of freedom, then there's six of them, so they're killing all six degrees of freedom, and there's, there's no degree of freedom. So if you wanted to figure out what's the, what's the minimum number of degrees of freedom, six minus six would be zero. So it's like, well, it's got to have at least zero. Well, that's not helpful. Um, okay, but, but yeah, if this is exactly constrained, then it's totally exactly constrained. Well, I'll tell you it isn't exactly constrained. It's not totally exactly constrained. There is a redundant uh, wire in there, okay? So this is over constrained, okay? And how could you know that? Well, so far from what I've told you, if you can't visualize, well, one, you could look at it and visualize, and if you're very clever, you could see how it could move. Um, and then you could know, well, since it moves that way, it's got to be over constrained. Um, there's got to be a redundant constraint because, you know, each one's not killing a unique degree of freedom. Uh, another way you could do is you could cat it and do a modal analysis and see its first natural frequency and see if it's much lower than all the other natural frequencies um, and see if it makes sense to your brain as it moves. But really the easiest, the best way to do it is, is from what I taught you is draw the blue lines and uh, you know, draw the blue lines through, uh, through each of these wires and see if you can find a red line that intersects it somewhere at least once. And if you can't, if you can't find one, if it doesn't exist, then you know it's totally exactly constrained they're all non-redundant. If it does exist, that means there is a degree of freedom, and that means uh, at least one of the wires is uh, over-constraining it, is redundant, okay? Well, and I'll give you a hint, this is not totally exactly constrained, right? This is over-constrained, there is a redundant wire, and there is a degree of freedom. So use the rule of complementary patterns and find a red line that intersects all six of those blue lines somewhere at least once. Okay, put me on pause. Okay, I'll say you did that, I'm about to tell you the answer. It is right here, okay? This red line intersects this blue guy there. Intersects, if I drew this blue guy, it would intersect that there. Intersects this blue guy there, this blue guy there. And it is parallel to this blue guy and parallel to that blue guy, which means it would intersect them at infinity either there or in that direction, okay? So that is a red line that satisfies the rule of complementary independence for all six things. Therefore, it works. And if you did a CAD model of this and grounded these, you would see it rotates. And you can imagine it could freely rotate around this without stretching or compressing any of those wires, okay? So that works. Now, the question is, okay, so it's, it's, it's over-constrained by one redundant wire. 
which is the redundant wire, which is the culprit. Okay, and this is a lot harder to think through because you have to consider these things. Like, so, so you say, okay, could this one be redundant? Is this one of the culprits? Well, the question is, if I took this away, would I add a degree of freedom or would nothing change? If nothing changes, it could be one of the redundant culprits. Well, if I took this away, you've got to use the rule of complement patterns again. And of course, this one's always going to intersect the, the five remaining ones. But is there another red line that intersects the five remaining ones if I took this away? Uh, put me on pause and think about it. But if you don't want to do that, I'll tell you the answer is yes, there could be a red line. The red line would appear here. If I got rid of this, there'd be a red line right up here that would, um, or wait, no, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. This one would not be redundant. <laughs> so, so okay. Um, so cha change, changing what I said. So, so this one, uh, if you took this away, it would not change anything. Okay. Right. There would be nothing that that could uh, that would it would add. This this could be a redundant one. Okay. What about this one? If I took this one away, would it change anything? Put me on pause and think about it. Uh, but and then turn back on. You'll see. Um, I'll give you the answer. If you take this guy away, then guess what? It would create a red line here, right? Because that red line would be parallel to those two guys. It would intersect this guy here, it would intersect this guy here, and it would intersect this guy here. Okay, so that one works. So this guy, this guy would be non-redundant. You, you can't, if you take this guy away, you add a red line here, okay? Same thing with this guy. If you take this guy away, say you move that guy away, you'd create a red line here because it would intersect that guy there, parallel to those two, and intersect this guy there, and intersect this guy there. Okay, so both of these guys are non-negotiable. They're, they're non-redundant. Um, neither of them are the culprit. If you take this away or take this away, you change the system, you add a degree of freedom. Okay? But the other four, um, if I take any of them away, or he said this one, if I took this one away, nothing changes. It does, you can't find any red line that works. If I take this guy away, Nothing changes. You can't find any red line that works. If you take this guy away, can you find any red line that works with any of these? Nope, you couldn't. Okay. Um, yep, there, there would be... Well, let's see. <laughs> Actually, if you took this guy away, yeah, I mean, it would be just the same red line there. Okay, it wouldn't... Yeah, that's right. And if you took this guy away, yeah, you couldn't do anything. So these two are the non-redundant ones, and the single redundant one would be any of these four. And the way you check it is you just check if you take any away, does it add a red line to the original one? And they don't. Okay. So that uh, that's how you would do this. That that, that kind of concludes uh, this topic. Okay. So um, we'll see you in the next uh, lecture.